We have Hunter Levins with me, live from, where are you live from today? Colorado or? No, sir, I wish I were. I am live from the Bard MBA in New York City. I'm okay. About two blocks away from Wall Street. <laughs> That's, that, that's convenient. Uh, you can keep an eye on them there. Yes, and uh, Hunter Lovins is world famous as uh, a writer, as the, uh, one of the originators of the natural capitalism concept, one of the seminal uh, speakers around the world when it comes to looking at different ways of seeing the economy, uh, as ways of dealing with uh, resource questions, of dealing with the idea that we can live much better by understanding the systems we are embedded in. And I've got this opportunity to be in conversation with her. And um, don't forget, because this is a diff, you can sign in your own uh, questions as you like uh, in the box underneath the screen. You can um, do that anytime throughout the session and we'll pick it up. But um, while you're doing that, I'm going to start off and ask a couple of uh, questions of Hunter. First of all, Hunter, Good evening, or good 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 afternoon, is it for you, or where are you in time? In in time at the moment, it is afternoon. Just became so in New York City. Yeah. Tell us something about yourself for anybody that there might be one or two who don't know what you've been up to in the in the last several decades. I know, and, and don't take several decades to explain it either, Hunter. I'm a Colorado cowgirl who somehow got stuck riding airplanes around the world, working on how we can keep humanity from falling into total system collapse and seeking out the good news of what's working and the people who are putting forth real solutions, aggregating those together, aggregating together the organizations that are doing that. So after I get through going to Seattle and British Columbia and Calgary and back to New York, I'll go to South Africa to help convene a number of these new economy groups trying to work together to build an economy in service to life. I'm an entrepreneur. About two weeks ago, I rang the bell on Wall Street, opening bell for the New York Stock Exchange on behalf of a little company called change finance, and that's exactly what we're trying to do, is transform the way finance is done to democratize impact investing. So for the price of a somewhat pricey pizza, about $18 US, you can buy one of our truly fossil fuel free ETFs, exchange traded funds. And I mentor for the Unreasonable Institute. I'm a professor here at the Bard MBA in sustainability. This is a program in which sustainability is baked into every class. I write books. I have a new book coming out uh, fall of next year called A Finer Future, Creating an Economy in Service to Life. Thank you very much. I mean, it makes me wonder uh, if I'm actually doing anything any day because you've done so much uh, in your time. But uh, let me ask a, 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 perhaps a, a slightly more pointed question. Why, why do we need, I mean, you, you ran a conference this last summer on regenerative economics. Why, why do we need a regenerative economics? You, you say it's in service to life, but isn't the economy in service to us anyway? <coughs> uh, no. As presently configured, the, the economy is doing a brilliant job of serving the 1%, the richest 1% of humanity, or even the 0.1 or 0.01% of humanity. Oxfam recently ran some numbers showing that the, that the 85 richest people on Earth have as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion poorest. Two years later, the number was that eight men have as much wealth as the bottom poorest half of humanity. Are you okay with that? I'm not. This system isn't working for, for essentially all of humanity. And we need a system that works for all of us, not just the richest. Our current system, as my friend John Fullerton points out, has us, people, the planet, 
serving the economy, which is in service to finance. We're very good at flowing money to the top. What's wrong with that picture? It's wrong way round. Finance is a tool to bring liquidity, money, to the real economy that delivers the goods and services we all need. And that economy ought to be in service to life. It ought to be in everything that it, it does, enhancing human and natural capital, as well as manufactured and financial capital, money and stuff. And right now, our mental model, which was given to us, this story of how the economy ought to work that we're all running to now, was given to us by 36 men in 1947, met at a hotel outside Montreux, Switzerland, a hotel called Mont Pelerin, and they crafted the story of what's called neoliberalism, where they said people are basically greedy, and all we want is to acquire, and once we acquire it, we're going to defend it. And that's okay because the market is perfect. Markets drive to equilibrium and therefore me against you works out for the better good of all of us. They said, therefore, the role of government is to be very small to protect the ability of private individuals to have contracts and life will be great. And life is great for a very few people on earth. For the rest of us, we are, we're on a bus hurtling toward a cliff. We are headed toward collapse. The scientists tell us we're beyond the planetary boundaries. Uh, the, the great thinkers like Kate Rayworth show that we are failing to meet the human minimums. There are now 65 million humans on the move, refugees from climate change, from failed economies. Where are they gonna go? Who wants them? Basically nobody. And so they are dying. There are going to be billions of climate refugees. Climate change is real and getting worse. And it is a phenomenon of an economy spun out of control in service to oil companies who tend to be the richest companies on earth, in service to the politicians who serve the oil companies. My secretary of state right now, used to be the CEO of Exxon, in service to monarchs, in service to corrupt governments. Again, this dog don't hunt, it's not working. And what we need, I submit, is a new story. Thomas Berry, the great theologian said, we're in trouble now because we don't have a good story. The old story, this story of neoliberalism told us who we were, and we said, oh, okay, I'm greedy. I'll be as greedy as I can be. And it said, markets are perfect. Like, oh, okay, I guess it'll take care of me. And it's not, it's breaking down. And it is taking all of us and indeed all of life toward destruction. We are now the first generation capable of ending life as we know it on the planet. And business as usual, that's where we're headed. And we're probably the last generation that can do anything about it. The great oceanographer Sylvia Earle says, what we do in the next 10 years matters more than what humanity does in the next 10,000. So what can we do? Again, as, as Fullerton said, we flip this equation so that finance becomes a tool to serve an economy that as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has so exquisitely portrayed, should be a circular economy where we're not throwing stuff away. It should be an economy in which we understand the right relationship, as uh, Peter Brown puts it, and as the ecological economists teach us, that the economy is this little linear process inside of society, which is inside of the biosphere. If we kill the biosphere, if we kill society, the economy is not worth much. We, we need to redefine what wealth means. We think wealth is money. That's only part of it. Money's useful, but wealth is well-being. It's healthy communities and healthy people. It's a sense of belonging. 
humans are innovative. We're adaptive. We're entrepreneurial. We create new solutions. We're not just greedy bastards. And humans need to be in a system where we have a say in the economy that's affecting us. This concept of Francis Moore LaPay's of empowered participation. We also need to learn to respect diversity. The biologists teach us that in nature, the most abundant ecosystems are where two come together, where a river meets the ocean, where a meadow meets the forest. Why? Because there is diversity. And where you have diversity, you have abundance. We need balance between this ability to flow money to where it's needed, not just to the rich, but to where it's needed throughout the economy, and resilience. Economic systems that can withstand shocks and get better and learn from it. And perhaps most importantly, we need to honor place, honor community. I'm very fond of good Scottish whiskey. We make perfectly good whiskey in Colorado, but we can have a global economy where I can buy my Talisker so long as the communities in Colorado have economic integrity, have ecological integrity. And then we can trade amongst ourselves for the luxuries and the special things that we want. The current belief of the economy is that we have to run trade as fast as we can because by increasing the velocity of trade globally, we increase money and stuff. Well, if that's your definition of well-being, yes, you do increase money and stuff, and we're losing life. More species are now going extinct than at any time since the dinosaurs died out. So I think if we take these eight principles that John Fullerton laid out in his brilliant paper, Regenerative Capitalism, and begin applying them in real communities, in real businesses, as I'm doing with change finance, we can be begin to see that we can create a finer future. We can create a world, in Buckminster Fuller's words, that works for 100% of humanity. And isn't that a better thing to yearn for than just putting more jingle in your jeans? Excellent, thank you. I, I was wondering about that key change between finance being on top and finance being a servant. Can you say a bit more about how you think that that's going to be achieved and some of the work you're doing in change finance? I think it's going to be achieved in several ways, from the bottom up and from the top down. Bottom up. Change finance invented this tool, an exchange-traded fund, where you or anyone can go on the New York Stock Exchange and buy one or 10 or 1,000 or a million. It's, a, it's in effect a stock traded on the exchange. It is a stock representing a bundle of companies, large cap American companies, blue chip companies, that are not part of the fossil fuel economy, are not part of driving harm into the economy. They're clean companies, they're companies that have committed to sustainability. We've eliminated the bad actors and we've done this to give people the opportunity to vote with their dollars for the kind of economy they want to have. Now, top down, we are about to enter what I'm calling the mother of all disruptions. There's a professor at Stanford named Tony Seba Silicon Valley the entrepreneur. Tony says, inevitably, because of four things, by 2030, the world will be 100% renewably powered. Those four things are fall in the cost of solar, fall in the cost of storage, the electric car and the driverless car. You put those together, this mashup of technological innovation and business model innovation, and Tony says you have a tenfold drop in the cost to you and me of what we want, which is to move around. He said throughout history, whenever you have a tenfold drop in cost price, you get disruption. If Tony is correct, we are looking at 
the dissolution in value of the oil, gas, coal, uranium, nuclear, utility, auto industries, the banks that hold paper in them, and the pension funds that are invested in them. This is another reason we created Change Finance. Where do you want your money? Do you really want to be invested in these guys that are facing an existential risk? Now, after uh, we in my country elected the child in chief, I wanted to talk to Tony to see if he thought this was still on. So I did last June, and as we were making a film of his presentation, and if you Google SEBA, S-E-B-A, C-R-E-S, which is Colorado Renewable Energy Society, you will get the little video that we did with Tony, and he walks through why he thinks this is true. And I asked him, and he said, oh, yeah, now I'm convinced. So I've been watching. Fall in the cost of solar, the Saudis just announced they are selling out of Aramco, and they just commissioned an 800 megawatt solar array at 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour. That's cheaper than energy efficiency. Uh, by contrast, just running a natural gas plant is about four to six cents. Running a coal plant, eight cents. Running a, a building a new coal plant, 10 cents. New nuclear, 20 to 25 cents. Just do the math. Solar is sweeping. This year, the Chinese hit already their target for 2020 in terms of solar. There is likely to be 100 gigawatts. A gigawatt is roughly a nuclear-sized chunk of electricity in solar brought on this year. It used to be that we were celebrating that we had 100, uh, 100 megawatts, uh, gigawatts, excuse me, 100 gigawatts of solar in the entire world. Now it's coming on every year. California just announced they will, by 2020, hit their target of being half renewable, which they had set for 2030. Storage, batteries. When the hurricane stopped in Puerto Rico and 3.5 million Americans were out of power, out of water, out of food, Elon Musk started shipping batteries, power walls, and solar systems to rebuild Puerto Rico and do it right. Sauna and the German company is there as well, building solar-powered microgrids. We're going to see Puerto Rico emerge as a model of what's possible. A year ago, Elon installed 80 megawatts of battery power to deal with the fact that the Aliso Canyon natural gas well had blown out. And he did it in six months' time, world record speed for bringing on a power plant of any variety at a price point roughly equal to building a new natural gas peaking plant. Electric car. China just announced they're phasing out the internal combustion engine. So uh, about a month ago, Jerry Brown in California said to Mary Nichols, who runs the California Air Resources Board, if China's doing it, can we? Two days later, Mary said, sure. Two days later, Jerry said, then we will. That was a Friday. The following Monday, General Motors announced our future is electric. The next day, Nissan announced a suite of solar on your roof, batteries in your garage, electric cars, all capable of being grid integrated. The driverless car, I was just with Tom Chi, who was the lead designer on the Google car. And I said, Tom, is this guy off? Could this happen? Could we have basically all vehicles running around being driverless by 2030? He said, within 10 years? Oh yeah, easy. So it's happening. And it is scaring the snot out of the utilities. Smart utilities will see this as an opportunity to transform their business model. Stupid ones will die. Now, if we, and this is where it gets interesting. If all these industries, oil, gas, coal, uranium, nuclear, utility, auto industries collapse, this is going to crash the global economy. And folk like Mark Campanelli at Carbon Track have have run the numbers on what the, the assets that have to be stranded, the coal, oil, gas that has to 
stay in the ground if we're going to save the planet from roasting. And it, it comes on John Fullerton's numbers to about 20 to $30 trillion in stranded assets. By contrast, the 2008 mortgage collapse was $2.7 trillion, and it about collapsed the global economy. I was just with Mark in Italy, and he said, it's worse than that, Hutter. He said, if you count the foregone revenues by not digging up and selling and burning this stuff, it's $100 trillion. We have no earthly idea how to deal with a disruption of this magnitude. Yeah. Yeah, if and I this can... is what's coming at us. So, yeah. as I said, we're going to do it from the bottom. We're going to do it from the top. But we are going to do it. I'm just slightly worried now because it sounds great on one level. You can you can uh, reveal all these stranded stranded assets, and uh, some of our assets are falling off the uh, stage there. But what if this is going to disrupt and well, it might just crash the economy, Hunter. I mean. What has to be in place? It just might if we don't get smart. Okay, so, <laughs> but that means you're sort of almost saying, yeah, if we don't get smart, it's going to crash the economy. But what are we going to do about, say, the, uh, well, I think about the creation of credit, about money. Uh, if banks become uh, illiquid, um, there's going to have to be some clever thinking about making sure there's a sufficient uh, circulation of money, let alone materials, isn't there? What, what ideas are, are you dealing with about... Absolutely. Mm. So can you tell us a little bit about what you might think of in terms of, well, I think brutally would be called a monetary policy or, or how credit and how money is supplied? Do you have anything? Because if it's an integrated system, we can't just talk about materials, we can't just talk about energy, or in a moment we'll talk about agriculture, but... What ideas are there around to integrate uh, the, the money flows into this discussion of resources? Well, this is precisely why I'm going to South Africa to sit down with people who are a lot smarter than me. People like Stuart Wallace, who for 20 years ran New Economics Foundation in the UK. Uh, People like Lorenzo Ferramonti, who has pulled together what he's calling the We Seven Nations. These are seven countries who sent ministers of various sorts to a meeting in Scotland about a month ago. Countries like Costa Rica or Sweden or Slovenia or Scotland itself saying, we want to start measuring and managing based on human well-being, based on ecological well-being, not on gross domestic product. People like Dr. Robert Costanza, who was the father of ecological economics, uh, Catherine Trebek, who works with Oxfam, there are, there are a whole uh, Richard Wilkinson, Kate Pickett, who wrote the book Spirit Level run the Equality Trust in the UK, Dr. Jacqueline McGlade, who uh, has been running, uh, who's the chief scientist for uh, UN Environment. Really smart people to start to say, what systems do we have to shift to avoid this kind of total system collapse? How do we do it fast? How do we have systems in place so that when the existing systems start to crumble, we have an answer. In 2008, the system started to crumble and everybody said, oh, prop up Wall Street. And now we have a system where the big banks are bigger than they were in, in 2008. Part of the answer is again, to go back to story. Humans have always learned by story. So who are we? Are we greedy bastards? Is this who we are? It turns out the scientists say that's actually wrong. Dr. Paul Lawrence at Harvard, uh, Dr. Michael Pearson at Fordham University say, look at the DNA record, look at the archeology. span When the pre-humans came down out of the trees in Africa, we were naked, our claws aren't worth much, our teeth are pretty inadequate. 
there were apparently lots of bands of pre-humans who were not as fast as a lion, and many of them went extinct. We, you and I, and everyone listening to this, are here today because we are the descendants of those who survived. And they survived, say the archaeologists, the evolutionary biologists, because not only did they acquire and defend, they bonded. They cared more for the well-being of each other and the whole than any of them cared for themselves. And this, they say, is in our DNA because we are those who survive. And it is a much better explanation of who we are as human beings than this neoliberal narrative that all we are is greedy bastards. Yeah, yeah. I take and the second thing that these prehumans did was they invented, they entrepreneured, they created solutions to the problems that were in front of them. They comprehended and they told story. So yeah, we like to get stuff, we like to defend it, but more than that, we love to bond with each other, we love to take care of each other, and we love to begin again. This, I think, this second half of what it means to be human is the core of what can rescue us. Okay, that helps me quite a lot, but what I need to know, and I think many people uh, listening or watching would need to know is, since the story of the economy that we have lived with, at least since, uh, since World War II, has been around jobs and growth, that's always been the payoff, whether it was done with a, a more government involvement or whether it's done with the more, uh, as you call it, neoliberal approach. They want to know what's the new economic story. They perhaps might agree with you that we need to be the... Um, altruistic or, or should we say, um, active reciprocators. We like to exchange both gifts and caring for each other, and we can be competitive too. They might get that in the terms of human uh, story, but they want to know, well, how am I going to be better off in whatever way you want to, s to talk about better off? How am I going to be better off? What are going to be some of the, the policies or the approaches? Do we, for instance, have 100% reserve banking. In other words, we don't allow banks to create money. I mean, what I'm looking for is a few of those sorts of economic ideas which complement a more developed social description. You know, you've, you've illustrated how we are not just selfish, but there's an economic question to be dealt with in terms of the ideas of economics. And, and I, I wonder what you think the best sort of economic ideas are at the moment. You've illustrated a little bit with finance, and you've illustrated the problems of uh, the big industries at the moment who might have stranded assets. But do we have anything to say on... <clears throat> there are a number of answers. Mm. And I, it, one easy answer is to say, read my new book, A Finer Future, in which we lay all of this out. And the book, by the way, is written with Stuart Wallace, with John Fullerton, with Anders Wiegmann. So it's, it, it, it's again, trying to bring some of the, the best thinking together. But you need to go sector by sector by sector. In energy, it's easy. Solving the climate crisis is profitable. The companies that are the leaders in measuring and managing their carbon footprint have 18% higher return on investment than the laggards, 67% higher than the companies that say, we don't care, we're not going to measure. Those are CDP's numbers. The companies like Unilever that are saying, we are in business to serve the world, have faster growing brands, they're purpose-driven brands, represent something like 60% of the profitability of the company. And so they're saying now to all their brands, you need to find your authentic purpose and become part of being in service to people, to the planet, because it's better business. Renewable energy generates 17 times the number of jobs that building new power plants generate. Per megawatt saved in a community, you generate over $2 million in increased economic activity, 
over half a million dollars in increased wages. Agriculture, the, the industrialists say, oh, we're all going to be Monsanto. We're all going to be highly mechanized, highly chemicalized. OTAD begs to disagree. They say the only way we're going to feed the world is with smart, smallholder organic agriculture, which is what we have de facto in 80% of food production around the world today. Only 20% of food production comes from the big industrialized folk. And we now know that if you do agriculture right, you can roll climate change backward because regenerative agriculture takes carbon out of the atmosphere and puts it back in the soil. There's an old adage I just heard. Ranchers should bury underwear in their fields. Like, why? Because cotton buried in soil that has high organic material, a lot of life, a lot of microorganisms, will be eaten within weeks. Cotton buried in a dead, sterile soil, which is what most industrial soils now are, will still be there a year from now, two years from now. So how do you know if you have rich organic soil? Bury your underwear. underwear. That's a good point in which to just take, we don't do commercial breaks, but we need to talk a little bit about what else is coming up on the diff. I'd like to hand over to my, I was told to say colleague, but I'm tempted to say friend Maya. And hello everyone online. We are now in the final week of the diff, but fear not, there's still four days of interesting session left. And here are just like some of the few that I'm looking forward to follow. So starting with Wednesday, um, can you imagine a city that is just as vibrant and healthy as a forest? Um, that is the vision of the architect Kin Ying's ecological responsible architecture. Uh, which builds on the belief that buildings and indeed cities uh, should be built uh, to maximize vegetation. For those of you who are interested in enabling technologies in agriculture, I will uh, recommend you to tune in on Thursday to meet uh, Confidence uh, from Nigeria, who is an um, <coughs> entrepreneur and um, an in uh, computer engineer, and he uh, will tell us all about how use of drones uh, in farming can transform agriculture. And then finally on Friday, uh, the last day of DIFT, I will definitely recommend you to join me here in the, the live studio uh, to explore the opportunities of innovation districts in cities and also uh, explore um, um, what our, like, why our geography teachers were all right when they said place matters. So now uh, do remember to go into our website, thinkdiff.co, to re-watch or watch sessions you missed. Uh, also remember to follow us on social media um, and uh, tune into the conversation by adding your thoughts, comments, questions using the hashtag thinkdiff. Uh, thank you and now I'll hand over to you, Ken. Welcome back and uh, welcome back to Hunter. We were discussing underwear and soil which is a great place to jump in and out. Now, I know you're a rancher yourself. That's pretty self-evident. And you've been involved with what's called um, holistic grazing. Uh, there are different words for it. And that's quite controversial, isn't it? Or, or there seems to be a tension between a practice which is expanding all over the world and what some scientists think about it. Is this part of our problem too, is that sometimes practice can get ahead of science? Do you have any particular thoughts on this? I know you're really involved in regenerative agriculture. Can you tell us a bit about the state of the debate and why we perhaps should be, if we can be, why should we be hopeful about this? We should be very hopeful about it. There are several known ways to take carbon out of the air, put it back in the soil. Rodale Institute style organic compost-based vegetable production can do this. And Rodale Institute has reams of documentation of how much carbon their practices take out of the air and put back in the soil. Savory Institute 
similarly has reams of documentation of how holistic grazing practices take carbon out of the air and, and put it back in the soil. And we, we just got a new piece of evidence from the universe, or Washington State University scientist named Dr. Mark Kramer, who showed that certain farming practices can dramatically increase carbon in the soil, writing in nature communications, Kramer documented how three farms converted to management intensive grazing raised their carbon levels to those of native forest soils in just six years. He found a 75% increase in soil carbon. A rancher farmer named Gabe Brown in North Dakota, and you can go online, Google Gabe Brown, keys to building a healthy soil, and watch his video explaining what he did. He did it because he was going broke, growing commodity corn and soybeans. So first he stopped breaking the soil, plowing it up. He went to what's called no-till farming. Then he planted cover crops, 28 different species of cover crops. Then he turned cows and sheep and goats and pigs and chickens out into the fields managing them the way that grazing animals co-evolved with the world's grasslands. So dense packed, used to be dense packed because a wolf was about to eat you, or in Africa, a lion was about to eat you. Here you use electric fencing or open and close water holes. He found on some of his plots, he went from a little over 1% soil organic matter in, in the soil to over 11% over a 10 year period. How did he get there? The microbes, the microbiological community in the soil, same thing that eats your underwear, was taking the sugars that roots slough off when a cow eats the top of the grass. They take those sugars, break the carbon down and turn it into soil carbon, into mineralized carbon. When the, great, when the pioneers first went across the Great Plains in my country, they, they found 10 feet of thick black soil. That black is carbon. With our modern industrial techniques, it's now down to inches. But we can put it back by using practices like Gabe Brown. Now, why does Gabe do it? He's not a scientist. He's just trying to stay in business. And now he's wildly profitable and selling a diverse array of crops, not just commodity industrially produced corn and soybeans. Because he has the fertilizer from the animals, because the microbiological community is able to fix nitrogen, he doesn't need fertilizers. Because he's not planting monocultures, he doesn't need herbicides, pesticides. Because he's not breaking the soil, he doesn't need all the mechanical energy. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot more profitable. Similarly, Will Harris down in Bluffton, Georgia, is revitalizing the community of Bluffton. This was a community that was crumbling, being covered with kudzu. His 2,500 acres are farmed holistically so he grows a variety of meat products, vegetable products that he sells as far away as Chicago in the United States to various Whole Foods. He has an agro-tourism operation on his facility. He has 137 employees. His neighbor, who is a commodity farmer, has four. So I hope you can begin to see this is how we create jobs we create community vitality place by place by place. At the same time, we're providing much tastier food for all of us, much healthier food. When you do industrial agriculture and grow vast swaths of corn and soybeans to feed to cows, cows were never designed to eat corn and soybeans. They're designed to eat grass. So you take them off the grass where there is methanotropic bacteria. They burp, they fart, they put out methane. 
the methanotropic bacteria eats it, it all, all works. Put them now on concrete, feed them corn and soybeans, no methanotropic bacteria, cows that were never designed to eat corn and soybeans, they're getting sick. So you feed them lots of antibiotics. Now we're getting sick. <laughs> this is modern farming and it's daft. It's also not profitable or it's profitable to a very few. And most of humanity cannot practice this. So let's get smart about agroecology, about compost, about holistic management. And when we do that, we'll be rolling climate change backward. We'll be creating good jobs. We'll be creating communities with vitality. It's just a better world to live in. Would you say that what ties all this together is a, a framework for thinking? Is there some commonality that unlocks the key to all of these innovations in the way we think? Yeah, I believe it's called Think Diff. <laughs> well done, thank you for that. Uh, it's also called systems thinking, of course, and, and working at appropriate scale with multiple cash flows, with multiple benefits to activities. <laughs> This takes education, doesn't it? This takes learning because it's not how we've been brought up increasingly over the last few decades. So I wonder if you'd like to sort of, in a way, round off with your view of how, since this is an educational sort of opportunity or an educational series, in the broad sense, it's informal education. What, what for you does all of this imply for how we, how we educate people? in the now and in the future and in, as you say quite urgently it is quite urgent i think we each need to see ourselves as though the entire world were held in balance and any act we do could shift that balance this was what maimonides said humans ought to do and we need to educate different that's why I helped create the Bard MBA. This is a master's in business administration in which sustainability, regenerative thinking, systems thinking, humanistic management is embedded in every class. Yeah, we teach economics, the sort of economics I've just been talking about. We teach finance, how to do impact investing. We teach all of the normal business classes, but they're all taught from the standpoint of how do you honorably do business in this time of human crisis. And our students are getting jobs at some of the biggest and best firms. They're creating their own companies. One of our graduates is even now running for Congress. She says because of what she learned in our political economy class, that it's important that individuals take responsibility for the communities where they live and begin to implement the solutions that we need. So we need, need a lot more, more, more education like the Bard MBA. We need to embed this into education at all levels. We need to embed it into politics. We, we need to take responsibility for who we elect to office. And I say this looking at Americans, we screw it up. We need to fix it. But this is now rolling across Europe. It's rolling across Latin America. There's this pivot to the right because people are scared. They're scared because of immigrants. They're scared because the systems aren't serving them anymore. The solution is not to double down on neoliberalism. That doesn't work. We've seen that it doesn't work. The solution is to create an economy in service to life. That's a very nice, an excellent rounded statement. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I should give you an opportunity just to say a bit more about this new book because it intrigued me. You just mentioned it in our intro and partway through it. When is it available? Is it available now? When will it come out? And is this going to be your last book uh, for this series or have you got something planned for the future? Because you keep upping your game all the time and, uh, you know, that even with the best will in the world, there's always uh, a sense that you might have reached uh, near perfection? Oh gosh, I'm nowhere near perfection, as anybody who works with me would be happy to tell you. 
this is just the latest in the effort to try to put forth solutions. About uh, six, eight years ago, I was asked by the king of Bhutan to reinvent the global economy. He said, Hunter, your job is to reinvent the economy. So me? So started asking folks smarter than me and arguing that there has to be a better way. Collapse is not inevitable. Ran into some of our friends at the Club of Rome who, being the Club of Rome, were saying, nah, we're all going to die. And I said, yeah, eventually, but not yet. And we can create a finer future. They said, prove it. So several of us sat down and started writing this book. Is it my last? I hope not. A lot of people say I ought to tell the story of my life. I, myself, I find that somewhat uninteresting, but at some point I'll do that. The book I really want to write is called Rex Rodeos and Wild Rides. It's about uh, life as a cowgirl, rodeoing and packing into the high country and hanging out with people who had no idea what I do for my day job. And in that kind of a community, you're only as good as the work you do, who you are as a human being. They're not starstruck because they had no idea. In many ways, that's the world that I aspire to go live in. For better or for worse, I will not see Colorado until about Christmas. My fate these days is to ride airplanes and go down the road having conversations like mm -hmm. this. But uh, maybe one of these days, if, uh, if all of these ideas start getting implemented, I'll be able to hang up my spurs and sit on the porch at the ranch. What an excellent aspiration. You still didn't tell us when this book is out. Oh, oh, sorry, fall. Uh, I had two choices. I could self-publish and bring the thing out now, but I was uh, talking with uh, New Society publishers, and they convinced me that the book will have a better life if I work with some professionals. So it, it, uh, it'll come out, out from New Society probably early fall of uh, 2018, which, given that that's right before the American elections, maybe that's a good time to have it hit the market. Yeah. Well, I think whatever people might say, I've, I've going to, to, to end that uh, on that very up, upbeat, uh, upbeat point. Uh, I don't want any more doom and gloom, and that's not my style, and it's not your style. Uh, so it only remains for me to say thanks so much for, for being with us today. And um, long may you continue with your, with your activities. Thank you very much, Hunter. Jim, thanks so much for having me with the gift.